Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us during the Lithum Partners Spring 2024 Investor Conference. My name is Roger Weiss, and I'm a Vice President of Lithum Partners. In this discussion, we welcome A2 Biopharma, NASDAQ ticker symbol AYTU, and with us today is their Chief Executive Officer, Josh Disbro. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that management is available for one-on-one -on -one meetings later this week. If you've not already signed up, please send me an email at weissatlithampartners.com or visit www.lithampartners.com slash virtual and click on the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button. Okay, Josh, let's start. Uh, why don't you just please introduce yourself and give us a brief overview of the company. Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Roger, and thanks to Lithum for hosting this event. Uh, Josh Tisbro, co-founder and chief executive officer of A2 Biopharma, as uh, as Roger mentioned. Uh, my background, I'm 27 years in pharmaceuticals. This is all I've ever done, uh, mostly on the commercial and entrepreneurial side, um, having started off as a sales representative and uh, prior to co-founding AYTU, A2 Biopharma, with my brother, another gentleman, uh, exited a uh, company we started from scratch. And uh, we exited when we sold our stake to KKR. A2 was a specialty pharmaceutical company that we started from zero, zero revenue, zero products, zero infrastructure, and exited following um, um, a peak of revenues in the $250 million range annually. And so we started A2 as a uh, as a follow-on company to that and are off to a really good start. Um, we're about an eight and a half, nine-year-old company, have grown through a series of strategic transactions and most notably a couple of acquisitions um, following the pandemic, one of which was the acquisition of Neos Therapeutics, which got us into the ADHD space, having previously acquired a, a group of products uh, in the pediatric realm. So now the company is uh, fully integrated as a pediatric and ADHD focused, especially pharmaceutical company. Uh, we've had some major changes over the last couple of years to streamline operations, which we'll talk about, but ultimately the company has grown significantly both through organic growth as well as through acquisition and inorganic based growth. And we're poised for more growth as we go forward and are really focused on growing uh, profitability as we get towards cash flow here. Great. And uh, Josh, uh, you just kind of alluded to it. Um, A2 is really now in the home stretch of converting from its original three segment business of, uh, of specialty pharma, OTC, consumer health, and drug development. Uh, to concentrating just on its prescription business. Uh, what's the latest update and how has that impacted the company's cash flow generation? Yeah, so the company, um, frankly, has had a lot going on over the last several years. As I mentioned, the company was built through a series of strategic transactions, inclusive of the acquisition of a consumer health uh, company. The acquisition of Neos Therapeutics um, came with uh, the acquisition of their manufacturing facility. And along the way, we had acquired a pipeline, uh, an asset, a uh, very exciting pipeline uh, asset for a rare disease. And then, of course, we had the the, the specialty pharmaceutical RX business going on along with that. And uh, not only was there a lot going on, we had a lot of cash burn. This is a company that just two years ago really had a net loss in the $100 million plus range. And if you fast forward to uh, these last handful of quarters following the transition, uh, we're, we're EBITDA positive and considerably so. But uh, specifically what we were is we were a company that did a little bit of everything, RX, OTC, manufacturing of products and R&D. And so in October of 22, we made the decision while it was difficult, it was necessary given the capital markets condition and just sort of where the company needed to go. We elected to stop really any operation around the business that was not cash flowing, one of which was R&D. So we indefinitely suspended our re uh, research and development efforts around our pipeline back in October and uh, more or less immediately slowed down spending. And we've now gotten spending down to zero. While we have an asset in, in our pipeline, we've really, uh, we were really spending de minimis on it, just enough to keep the patents fresh and, and keep the, the lights on, so to speak. A second part of that transition related to the shutdown of the uh, Grand Prairie, Texas manufacturing facility that was the headquarters and original manufacturing site uh, of Neos and for the two products that we have in our bag today at Zenis and Cotempla. That's a very large manufacturing facility. It's about 77,000 square feet uh, manufacturing two specialty products. Uh, while these are important products and they're really big products in, in our scheme of things, they're relatively small in the context of their ability to really occupy um, space and um, uh, and fill up the fill up the operations. So we're shutting that facility down, and I'm happy to say we're in the final stretch of getting out of that facility. 
in favor of moving those products to a contract manufacturer, which has already been FDA approved um, and which is already actually producing both of our products uh, on the ADHD side at Zenis and Cotempla. And then finally, while we did acquire the consumer health company, frankly, we found it challenging over the last couple of years coming out of the pandemic to get it profitable. Supply chain challenges and cost of goods um, were, um, were really just problematic for the, the most of that franchise. And while we thought we could continue to grow it, top from a top line perspective, we did not believe it could be um, additive to the bottom line. And so we have elected to shut that down as well in favor of driving cash flows. And that ex we expect to be really shut down in full by by mid calendar 24. Um, we, we are um, in, in earnest winding it down. We're essentially only selling uh, inventory that remains. We're not buying any new inventory. We've dramatically uh, decreased the staffing there. Expect to have a, a series of small layoffs here in the summer, and we'll essentially put that business to bed in favor of driving uh, cash flows for the RX business. So we went from a lot going on to much less going on, much more focused, but much more focused on value creation, EBITDA expansion, and ultimately cash flows. And so um, we're sort of a painfully simple story when you look at us going forward, especially pharmaceutical company focused in pediatrics and ADHD, all virtual supply chain, no, no material spending on R&D pipeline until such time as we can cash flow with our revenue generating products, at which time we will consider dropping uh, additional assets into the portfolio, whether those are uh, commercial stage assets or potentially some low cost development uh, assets that we can bring through the pipeline. But for today, head down, focused on growing the prescription business and focused on driving EBITDA, which has been positive for the RX business seven out of the last eight quarters. Josh, uh, and then, you know, maybe we could dig into that a little deeper. And when the shift is completed, A2 will be 100% specialty pharma. And can you discuss the constituent parts uh, of that specialty business? And how should we think about both the products and their growth prospects? So A2 going forward, and really we think of ourselves as a pure play spec pharma company today because we're so sufficiently finished with the major wind down efforts around consumer, around getting out of Grand Prairie. And to be clear, we'll be out of the Grand Prairie, Texas facility, certainly by the end of the calendar year, if not sooner. So we really are focused on um, what we call the RX segment, RX business today, which can can uh, is comprised of our ADHD franchise, which we acquired through the acquisition of Neos Therapeutics. And the ADHD products are at Zenis XR ODT and Cotempla XR ODT. And they compete in the ADHD stimulant category, uh, which is a multi-billion dollar prescription category here in the United States. ADHD is a prominent condition that's typically diagnosed in childhood or early adulthood. And stimulant medications are the standard of care for ADHD when it comes to medical treatment. And these products compete in the biggest part of the market, and they compete against some of the largest brands this country has ever seen, most notably Adderall and Adderall XR and Concerta. Um, at Xenis XR ODT is an orally disintegrating tablet formulation of amphetamine, which is the active ingredient in Adderall XR. It's, in fact, approved as bioequivalent to Adderall XR. And I'll come back to why that's important here in a moment. And then we have a product called Cotempla XR ODT, which is a long acting, also an orally disintegrating tablet formulation of methylphenidate competing with the lights of Concerta, uh, which is the largest brand in that category. Um, at, going, at, going back to Xenis XR ODT, as I mentioned, it is bioequivalent as approved by the FDA to Adderall XR, which is important. Not just because Adderall XR is the market leader, uh, both across the branded Adderall XR as well as its generic equivalents. Uh, it's also in, been in a sporadic and um, relatively longstanding short supply over the last several years. In fact, starting really last uh, fall before last, uh, a shortage was announced from the largest manufacturer of generic Adderall XR. And really ever since then, it's been a headache for patients and caregivers and providers to get their hands on prescriptions for branded and generic Adderall XR. And so we've been able to step in very nicely over the last couple of years and fill the gap as an as a uh, bioequivalent alternative, but one that is actually available in a very easy to take orally disintegrating tablet and um, for, for reasons we'll talk about here shortly, delivered in a way that really makes it seamless and painless for patients to get in a, a day and age when it's very difficult to get branded and generic medications reliably, just given some of the shortages that are widespread, uh, not just within the ADHD category, but really across multiple therapeutic categories. Drug shortages are at their highest level in history when you look at some of the reporting that's been done recently. Um, and we fortunately have never had a stock out and have been able to satisfy the demand um, that's been created by virtue of the gap that's in there due to Adderall XR being out of stock. And again, it's been a long time uh, that this has been happening. Um, 
uh, almost two years now. Um, there is some return to normal, um, but with that, we've continued on our nice growth trajectory because when patients get switched to our product uh, at Zenis, they like it, they stay on it, and patients stay very, very sticky. And so this is a big opportunity for, for us as a relatively small company to come in and command, command increasing market share at a time when patients are fed up, they're frustrated with the inability to get their drugs, but they're as frustrated with, uh, even in the event they're able to get their Adderall XR, um, the, the variability in copay, the variability in access, can the pharmacy get it today or do they have to wait two weeks? Um, and of course, there's inherent variability between the brands and the generics in this category. The brain's very sensitive to those uh, subtle changes. While they might be approved by the FDA as, an, uh, as a bioequivalent ANDA, uh, in many cases, patients will react differently between one manufacturer's product and the other. And so we, with through our nationwide sales force and through our communication efforts with doctors, simply go to physicians and, and their staff and say, if you're looking for consistency, if you're looking for the same product every time and you're looking for it um, in a consistent, reliable way, we have a solution for you. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so that, that's a bit about our ADHD franchise. Um, well, I guess before I leave that, I'll mention that we also have a, sort of a sister product in the methylphenidate category. Uh, methylphenidates tend to be a milder stimulant. They're a, they're a, they're a, they're a type of an amphetamine, but with a milder stimulant effect. Nevertheless, very prominently used in the younger age set. And our product, Cotempla XR ODT, or just Contempla, Cotempla, is an is a long acting, also orally disintegrating tablet, competing with the lights of Concerta, and it's indicated for patients between the ages of six and seventeen, and it's ideally suited for uh, preteens and, and teenagers that are uh, they have busy schedules, they, they may forget to take their tablet in the morning, they can quickly top, pop in an ODT, and they get all day long lasting relief for a full twelve hours, um, and that that product is also um, is also equivalent to extended release methylphenidate, which also have been in short supply more recently have actually been more problematic than even the amphetamines. So we're, we're, we've are we got these products growing. We've got these products out there into the hands of, of physicians to prescribe when they're looking for something else at a time when, frankly, they need something else because availability has been really challenging. And then we have a franchise of pediatric products, and these two came to us through an acquisition, an acquisition we completed just prior to the, the onset of the pandemic. So we acquired this product line back in late 2019. And these products are nice. Uh, um, products that that uh, fit a really unique niche within pediatric wellness. One product line is uh, is our multivitamins, um, led by our uh, polyvifluor line, and then we have a sister product called Trivifluor. And those products uh, fit in very nicely within the treatment paradigm for patients that reside in areas that don't fluoridate their water supply because these multivitamins contain formulations of not just multivitamins, but also sodium fluoride. And these products are prescribed by physicians. Um, while they're not drugs, they essentially masquerade as drugs because they do need to be um, ordered under the uh, or prescribed under the supervision of a healthcare provider, specifically a prescriber. And they tend to be prescribed, as I said, in areas that don't fluoridate the water supply where patients need uh, not just um, not just multivitamin support, but they need support to prevent dental caries, which is what obviously the purpose of sodium fluoride. And so those are a nice a branded product. They're, they're the leading brand in, in the category, compete with the generics, but they compete very effectively because this is a high quality uh, manufactured at um, a prescription drug grade. Uh, we've got a unique ingredient uh, along with sodium fluoride that is a proprietary formulation of folic acid or folate um, that's called Arcafol, and then we've licensed that ingredient exclusively in the U.S. market and so have the ability to go uh, into the market with a higher quality product that's manufactured at a higher standard with a unique ingredient. And what we what we say about Arcafolin as the as the uh, as our version, our branded version of L-methylfolate is it's body ready. Many patients will take folic acid or any supplement, frankly, for that matter, and not realize that in many cases, vitamins are really poorly soluble and not very bioready or bioavailable. We have we have ingredients, and most notably our folic acid ingredient, Arcafolin, um, that bypasses essentially an enzymatic process that disrupts the absorption of folic acid naturally to derive uh, body ready uh, L methylfolate. And so we've got an advantage. And pediatricians hear that story. They like the fact that this is high quality. We've got the folic acid that that is body ready and bioavailable, along with the sodium fluoride that's on board. And so uh, that's that's how those products compete. And those are also sold through our unique proprietary channel that we'll talk about here shortly called RX Connect. And then finally, we have a um, first generation antihistamine called Carbonyl ER, which is an extended release carbonoxamine that competes with the likes of both first generation and second generation antihistamines. And it's a workhorse antihistamine for patients that have tried everything under the sun. They've tried Claritin over the counter. They've tried second generation non-sedating antihistamines, and they continue to have you know hay fever or hives or drippy throat 
throats or whatever their allergic response might be. And the carbonyl ER is very, very effective in squel squelching some of those symptoms and getting patients back on their feet. Um, and it's a niche product. It's relatively small, It's um, uh, but it's growing. And we've got some really nice opportunity to, we think, continue to grow, not just um, not just the ADHD brands, but actually we think we ha have an opportunity to grow our pediatric brands as well. So um, they all compete in large categories, ADHD being by far the largest of the categories in which we compete, um, but all products, nevertheless, healthy categories, tried and true treatments. And we think we've got nice features and benefits to sell to physicians and the products really have good have had good trajectory and good momentum as of late that's really helpful uh, a minute or so ago you threw out a, uh, a statistic that i just want to circle back to uh you noted that the rx segment had generated positive ebitda adjust, positive adjusted ebitda in seven of the last eight quarters uh obviously the RX segment is becoming the business. Uh, so with that segment, you know, becoming the business on a go forward basis, how do, you know, how should we think about uh, the company as we kind of start going toward fiscal 2025? Yeah, we're, we're really excited about how we're positioned here heading into our fiscal 25, which starts July 1st, just a little over a month from now. And as you said, you know, the, the, the business over the trailing 12 months, if you look at the last four quarters ending this last March quarter that we just released results for 15 and almost 15 and a half million dollars in, in EBITDA. And if you look at specifically the RX segment, over $17 million. And look, that's in the face of a little bit of a downdraft with our pediatric products. And while we're excited about this product's growth um, and the current momentum we think we're picking back up, the last few quarters have been soft for the pediatric products. Um, and if you look at the ADHD growth and the momentum we have with those products, couple that with what we anticipate to be a get back to growth mindset for the pediatric franchise, I could envision that 17 plus million dollars in trailing 12 month EBITDA being significantly higher. Um, it, it, we, there's no reason to believe we won't continue to grow our ADHD brands. There's no reason to believe we can't get our pediatric franchise uh, up up off of the the current lower levels that they're that they're performing at. And when I look at you know April trends, when I look at the trends for ordering here in in, Mar in May, as we're as we're midway or so through that month and midway through our quarter. I'm very encouraged. And as you think about all the things that we're draining cash and, 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 and to some degree still are burning some cash, albeit you know, relatively minimal, those will go away. Full stop. You know, the consumer segment is is gone really at the end of our of our fiscal 24 year. We might have a little bit of lingering sales into the first month or so of fiscal 25, but they'll be de minimis. And frankly, there will probably be neutral to maybe even a slightly positive EBITDA with those. Well, shortly thereafter, we will be out of Grand Prairie, Texas. We will have a significant uh, layoff as it relates to the workers that are there. We've been very forthright with them. We've been very fair with how we've treated them and communicated with them. And they will fully exit the facility no later than this fall. And we'll close the doors and hand the key back, keys back at the end of at the end of calendar 24. And so as you think about sort of January forward, it's it's sort of the new life of A2 Biopharma as a focused RX specialty company that is uh, focused on driving revenue and really, really focused more than anything on driving cash flow as we go forward. So a little bit of growth to the top line, and you can envision how that 17 plus million is significantly greater when you think about cutting out additional costs, driving margins, which we would expect to do by virtue of transitioning out of the manufacturing facility in Texas, which is very costly. And by the way, I should say we've already made nice strides in improving gross margins, but we think we can improve those even further as we fully exit the facility. And as I said, just one last note on the R&D piece, we would love to get back into R&D at, at some future point, but that's no time in, in the near future, not at least for the next year or so before we even consider anything that requires any meaningful cash. Our, our charge is to drive cash flow, drive EBITDA, build a meaningful cash flow with these assets. And we think we have the assets in the bag that can do just that. So very excited about how we're positioned today, you know, just 45 days or so away from starting our fiscal 25. Very, very good. Uh, I want to also talk or ask you a question about something that you mentioned on your uh, uh, your recent quarterly conference call. Um, and you were talking about what was going on in uh, with the ADHD drug shortages and disruptions. And I think you mentioned that you were starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, why do you think that is the case? And what does this mean for A2 stimulant business? Yeah, I think we are starting to see some improvement as it relates to um, some of the products getting back in normal supply. But what I'll say is, 
you know, the amphetamine market has largely stabilized over the last several months. And even with that, we're seeing really nice growth. We're not seeing any meaningful regression in patients, for example, switching back on mass back to Adderall XR, which tells you we have a quality product that when they get switched to, they like it. So even as we think about seeing some of the shortages abating, um, we, we see no let up in the demand for our products because they've gotten quite literally a taste of its Templa, like how they feel on it, like how it controls their symptoms. Our products are a little more subtle than some of the incumbent products. Um, some people will call Adderall XR a bit of a hammer, a little bit heavy. They can almost get a little bit of a buzz, and uh, many patients don't like that. Our products are more subtle and a little bit more stable throughout the day and a little bit of a smoother ride as you're controlling your symptoms. And so even with the the, the some of the products coming back on board, I, I would expect... Um, I would expect us to continue our growth trajectory. So our, our stimulant business is going to stay strong. It's going to only be benefited from the fact that um, quotas actually have improved in terms of how they're allocated. And we'll talk about here in a second, but um, they, there's there's really good signs from the DEA, which is the agency that regulates um, and puts the controls on the distribution of stimulant products like like these products. And we're starting to see them communicate in a, in a more forthright fashion with more transparency. And so it's it's ultimately going to be a, the ability for us to continue to access the, the quota that we need and give us um, give us an opportunity to continue to show more and more patients what a good experience on these products can look like, not just in terms of how they feel and how it controls their symptoms, uh, but in how it affects their wallet, how it affects their peace of mind, knowing they can actually get it month to month at the same price at the same place and reliably. And so um, we're very bullish about, irrespective of really uh, what happens with respect to the ebbs and flows around the supply chain and around the API um, issues and quota uh, restrictions, um, first of all, we've never not um, we've never um, sh had shortages. We've never experienced any back orders in the life of these products. Always been able to meet the demand, even as demand has grown up, grown significantly. Even as we've grown revenues forty nine percent year over year, we've never we've never stocked out and have no intention to. So uh, with that, we're we're just excited about how we're positioned, and uh, we we continue to produce more and we continue to sell it, and uh, that's that's a good thing for these patients that need it. Josh, you, you touched a little bit on the uh, DEA. Uh, last quarter, your uh, ADHD uh, business, uh, the revenues were up 49%. Uh, how is the access to both raw materials? And, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit in more detail about, you know, what you're seeing from the DEA and the regulatory side of the world and, you know, both uh, specifically for the industry and your company. Yeah, given given the situation with some of the some of the shortages, uh, as I said, started almost two years ago, uh, the DEA um, has has become increasingly more cooperative with industry and how they interface with us. I'd say their level of communication has significantly increased. The frequency at which they're granting quota has increased. They originally went from annual quota grants to quarterly. Um, they actually heard loud and clear from industry that perhaps that wasn't the best way to go, so augmented that and moved to semi-annual quota allocation. So twice a year, now you can essentially go back and uh, request new quota for the second half of the year. But what I'll say is there's also um, uh, more a la carte types of interactions you can have with the DEA, which is which has been great, uh, very responsive to ad hoc requests, and um, we, we are interfacing with them regularly. So I'd say the, the posture vis-a-vis -vis the industry, uh, very positive change. We've had multiple in-person in face-to-face meetings with them, even as recently as the last month or so. Um, they want to make sure that they're doing right by patients first and foremost, because they are really driven by safety and obviously want to limit um, any diversion and any any negative things that could happen. But they're as committed to patient health and wellness. They want to make sure that the patients that need these and the manufacturers that produce these products can get them, can get them timely, can get them at the right levels. And so we feel like we are at a point where um, we're getting the right level of responsiveness with the DEA. And yeah, as you mentioned, with our sales being up so much, um, you know, is there an issue with quotas and issue getting access to raw materials? And what I'll say is we're actually about the, at the best point in terms of days on hand and safety stock that we've ever, ever been. So that's a great thing. And that's despite the fact that we're selling more than we really ever have. If you look at us over like the trailing 12 month or 18 month period, continue to grow, yet we continue to build stock and really put ourselves in a position that we can satisfy more and more demand. So even with that growth, very well positioned and really have a great partner with the DEA that um, obviously has come a long way, as, I, as I've alluded to, in improving their communication and ultimately making it easier for us to interface with and, and work with them. That's, that's really good to hear. You know, as long as we're talking about uh, the ADHD business, um, how important is A2's 
RX Connect operation uh, in terms of the growth of the ADHD business? And, and can you talk about it in you know both detail and how it differentiates A2 from you know other pharmaceutical companies selling ADHD products? A2 RX Connect has been really a critical element that's driven our growth uh, across our ADHD brands and has had positive impact on the pediatric products as well. Uh, it's really unlike anything else that any other pharmaceutical company does, and I, and I, I don't mean that as hyperbole. I, I mean that in that it truly is unique, and it's 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 not um, it's not something that we have taken from a, a vendor. It's not just an off the shelf um, program. It's truly a bespoke. 100% customized, homebrewed, whatever you want to say, um, program that benefits patients, caregivers, physicians, and pharmacies alike. Um, RX Connect was created from the ground up, and it is a program. It's not a network of pharmacies. It's not a copay program. It's not a card. It's it's all of the above and then some. And it differentiates us materially from other companies in multiple ways, one of which is we have one of the only industry pay no more than cards where you truly are capped in terms of your, your liability as a patient and what your copay would be. We essentially underwrite every prescription for any commercially insured patient that is prescribed any of our drugs. We run this program through a network of roughly a thousand pharmacies, mostly smallish independent pharmacies um, that are in good standing in their local communities and tend to be very helpful in working with branded manufacturers like A2. And but we take it a step beyond just referring patients and and prescribers to these pharmacies. We work directly with these pharmacies on a direct basis. They order from us in many cases directly. We have great insights to how they're interfacing with patients and how claims are being adjudicated and ultimately have ways to um, really understand the finite details of how pharmacies are are working with our with our prescriptions and making sure that um, they they understand how the how the buy down works. They understand how our prior authorization programs work, and they're making sure first and foremost that the patient is getting the drugs that they were prescribed, and as importantly, they're getting them predictably. One of the single biggest issues facing healthcare today and facing practitioners and patients is the controls that the PBMs have put in place to really limit choice in uh, pharmaceuticals. And whether that's brands, whether that's generics, whether that's specialty products, whether that's biologics, or whether that's uh, whether that's just straight, straight away uh, generics that you could theoretically get at any any neighborhood retail uh, pharmacy, it, there there is there are pain points along the way, and there are pain points that will tell doctors, well, this is going to require a prior authorization, or a pharmacy is going to call back and say we don't have it, it's not going to be available for a while. Ultimately, what we do by aligning with these pharmacies and working with them in the way that we do. We are able to go to a physician and say, prescribe our products, and these pharmacies will deliver white glove service to every patient that is prescribed one of our products. You will carry it on site, you'll have it available, or you'll have it available within 24 hours, and you will make sure that the patient is always paying the lowest price. And even at a time when, for example, the patient's deductible has reset and they have to come out of, out of pocket to cover, uh, maybe in some cases, the full price of their drug, we will underwrite that and charge these patients no more than $50. And that gives patients peace of mind, gives physicians peace of mind, knowing that they're not going to have a callback from the pharmacy or from the patient or the caregiver saying, I thought you said this was going to be a low copay. Why did I have to pay $400? It's not covered. I'm getting the runaround from this pharmacist. None of that happens. So we cut back the negative feedback loop back to the physician office. The patient gets the drug they need at a predictable price. And we benefit because we get a new patient on therapy. The pharmacy benefits because they get a new customer. In many cases, they'll get a new customer and their other prescriptions and their family's prescriptions. And the physician, of course, is happy because he or she is able to go about their day of prescribing medicines and prescribing the medicines they think their patients need, irrespective of coverage considerations. So it, it's a win all the way around. It's an intricate system, lots of inner workings, lots of proprietary aspects to how we analyze the data and how we understand sort of how the pharmacy is benefiting, how the patient is in, or ensuring that they're getting the lowest copay possible, and that to make sure that we are maximizing insurance coverage where it is available, and in many cases it is for our brands. And so um, we've really benefited patients and prescribers from this, um, from this really elegant, very intricate plan. And we continue to see growth for these products and drive more and more of our prescriptions through the uh, the A2 RX Connect network. Very good. Uh, I know we've touched on the next topic just a little bit, but I just wanted to go back and and circle and maybe dig down a little deeper. Um, 
as uh, you've been uh, moving to outsource uh, your ADHD uh, manufacturing to a third party uh, CMO, uh, we have seen uh, improvement both on the gross margin side and on your um, operating margin side. Uh, how you know, do you think about this as you actually close Grand Prairie and, you know, sometime in the second half of, of calendar 2024? And kind of where do you see margins, both gross and operating heading, you know, into uh, into the future? As you said, we, we've made some good progress already um, by virtue of a couple of things. Was, one is um, improvement in gross to nets has happened over the last year or so. And so that, that has a direct impact on gross margin as we look just to um, improve how we're doing things through Arcs Connect. We're driving driving up our, our, our gross to nets or net selling prices, and that, and that naturally um, supports the, the improvement on gross margins. But we also have improved gross margins by virtue of the fact that we, we have been driving higher volumes through that 77,000 square foot facility. And so just by virtue of an, uh, the, just the just the improving gross numbers moving through the facility, we're able to improve margins. And for example, last quarter, if you look at margins on the RX business in whole, which of course is beyond just ADHD, but we, we you know, we booked a 74% gross margin line versus 61% in, in, the, in the same quarter last year. So just organically by virtue of, 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 of the volumes, we're able to, um, to drive, drive mar nice margin improvement. Um, but we also have now started to outsource packaging, which is starting to have some impact on expenses. And of course that hits gross margin as well. And that'll start to be fully realized here in the, in the coming months. And so ultimately when you look at margins kind of in the mid to upper 70% range, depending on the month or the quarter, you know, you can see those margins improving further um, as we get fully out of Grand Prairie, something into the low 80s and, and I think aspirationally in the mid 80s. That's a material improvement when you look at our revenue line and you think about how that obviously naturally drops straight down um, to, uh, to, to, to EBITDA and to ultimately to free cash flow. And that's not too far away. If you look realistically, that as I mentioned, we're going to be out of the Grand Prairie facility by definition. Our lease is up at the end of the calendar year, um, and so when you get to sort of that January timeframe, we're going to start to see material improvements. Not massive, but you know, again, you could get something kind of into the low 80s, and then aspirationally in the outer years, maybe into the mid 80s. Um, that's 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 a dramatic improvement for for us and from where we sit today. And if you think about really where these margins were for the ADHD meds in particular say two years ago, shortly after the acquisition of NEOS, um, we are light years ahead of where we were. And what we advertised back then that we'd see a 20 plus percent or so improvement, we, we're, we're sort of already in that range. We've already materially improved, uh, particularly off of some of the lower quarters when, when margins were, were materially depressed. And one of the things that it helps with as well beyond margins is working capital. You know, obviously we've got a lot of raw materials, API included, um, tied up. We've got a lot of plant and equipment and things that are un underutilized. A lot of that hits gross margin, but some of that is just is just good old fashioned working capital, just cash that is tied up in raw ingredients and so forth. And so to be able to dispense with all of that, place a purchase order with the contract manufacturer, have that cash freed up to go to work for you for us to invest in other parts of the business, that's, that's attractive as well. So we're going to get pickups on the margin, the gross margin side. We're going to get pickups on the net margin side as we reduce additional expenses that, that don't flow directly through COGS. And then we're going to get improvement on working capital that just gives us flexibility in how we place our cash as, as things move forward. So um, it, it's uh, something we're excited about. And again, we've been fair to everyone in Grand Prairie, and this has been something that's been well-established and well-known for you know a couple of years now. And uh, we'll wish those folks well here as we as we move into the next uh, and final phase of, of our shutdown and, and, and let people move to their to the next phases of their career. Um, moving on to the next question. Uh, we have seen obviously and talked about some extremely strong organic sales growth that uh, you guys have generated. Is there any place, you know, when you look forward for uh, a product acquisition? And if so, you know, kind of what might it look like? And how would you both value that kind of acquisition? And obviously, how would you pay for it? 
Yeah, well, first things first, we, we wouldn't take any material cash off the balance sheet to pay for just any old acquisition. And frankly, uh, for, probably probably wouldn't pay much for any acquisition. We would look for uh, an asset not dissimilar from an asset that we that we recently acquired and are now getting ready to launch in the ADHD category. Uh, this is a is an ADHD medicine. It's a stimulant that um, sort of keeps company with Cotempla, but is slightly different. And it's in, in its duration of action. It's an established brand that's been around for a while. Uh, it's a product that we're acquiring. We acquired for nothing up front um, and we'll simply pay a royalty on uh, from sales uh, along with the, uh, with the transfer price. So it's a very clean deal. It's an upside deal to us and to the licensor. And we'll look to bolt on additional things like that. We'll look for things that complement uh, ARCs connect, things that we can plug into the network, uh, and we will definitely look for things that um, generally align with our uh, infrastructure, things that can be sold um, through our sales force in some cases, not necessarily as a universal must-have, but that's something that we would prefer. And these would be assets that we would really re review, uh, that we would look at as sort of tuck-ins, plug-and-play types of assets that can easily be leveraged through the sales force and through RX Connect, and products that we don't think we have to pay you know, a, a whole lot for, things that can be accretive almost immediately, things that don't drain a lot of cash, but things that can be meaningful offerings to physicians and pharmacies. And the notion of being able to surround physicians with other things in and around the ADHD and uh, mental health category, we, we think about those types of things that can be brought into the, into the fold, into the portfolio and run through the network. And as a way for physicians to have even more comfort that when I prescribe AT's products, um, they've got me covered on multiple areas, not just ADHD, but potentially beyond that. And so we're beginning to, now that we are at the point and really on the sort of the doorstep of starting to generate um, cash, understanding that our cash balance has basically stayed the same over the last two quarters plus, um, you know, we're in a position to potentially start poking out there and looking at some assets, but nothing too big yet because we think it's important to maintain and build build cash and really give it make sure it's, it's clear to investors that we remain focused on driving profitability. There will be a day in the near future where we can not just identify and bring in commercial stage assets, but um, farther down the road, maybe even development assets again, but only as supported by uh, by significant cash flows, which we can see in the horizon. Okay. Uh, you've also in the past discussed uh, international opportunities. Any update for us? Well, we recently signed a deal with a company in Israel and are happy to say that partnership is progressing well and, and it's going to take a while to get uh, Cotempla and Edzenis approved in Israel. But we um, got a really solid partnership um, with this company, a small private company there that we've been engaged with. Um, they think they can... Um, Make make significant inroads in the market. ADHD is a growing category. And it's a it's an increasingly important category therapeutically in Israel, and so we're happy to be partnering with them. And we're continuing to cultivate additional um, partnerships outside the U.S. and some of the markets where ADHD is a uh, you know is a significant opportunity. And uh, we don't have anything imminent, and nothing certainly uh, we would expect to announce in the coming week or so. But we definitely are excited about the progress we're making on the ex-U.S. out licensing front as it relates to our ADHD brands at Zenis and Co. Templa. So stay tuned for what I think could be, uh, you know, an exciting announcement or two as we think about XUS opportunities. And that, of course, does a lot to, um, you know, deleverage us from U.S. only revenue, gives us obviously a more diverse revenue stream um, and royalty revenue streams that could live for quite a long time and uh, excited about these uh, the partnership we do have in place and some of the other prospects that we believe could come to fruition. So, uh, you know, stay tuned for that. Very good. Um I'm hearing that A2's strong sales growth and positive adjusted uh, EBITDA uh, are, are causing the company to screen very well with potential investors. How do you think about the current valuation of the shares? You know, like any like any CEO, of course, I'm going to argue for the fact that we're undervalued as it re as it relates to our market cap in contrast to our you know our intrinsic value. You know, what I would say is for for investors that that are interested in companies that are focused on the bottom line that want to continue to drive EBITDA, and obviously we 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 ultimately expect to be driving uh, real earnings and cash flows, of course, to accompany that. I, I think it's a good time to be looking at the company. You know, we've crossed over the chasm. Difficult decisions, all but important decisions were made to position us this way. We're in the best position we've ever been. You know, to 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 look back over the last uh, twelve months, four quarters, to look out over the last eight quarters and see that seven of the last eight we were EBITDA positive. The RX segment is driving that. We're dropping really everything that's burning, and we're keeping what is earning. I, I think is a great way to think about um, how this probably. Um, 
um, influx over the over the coming uh, quarters. So I, I, I'd say it's a very good time to think about where the company is valued versus really where it, where it could be in the relative near term as more and more people pay attention to the fact that we are beginning to drop serious uh, dollars to the EBITDA line and one day we think to uh, uh, to net income and cash flow. Good. And, you know, as we get ready to wrap up, what excites you most about the company's future? You know, the ability to control our own destiny is really what excites me. You know, when you're in so many different lines of business and you're relying upon the capital markets and you're raising capital all the time, um, you know, you, you've not put yourself in the best position to achieve success. You know, the ball is not necessarily always in your hand. The ball's in our hand now. And we have the ability to to, to focus on the operations of the business and and drive um, meaningful shareholder value by focusing. And so, and what we're seeing is when we focus, we win. You know, what we set out to do a couple of years ago, we've done and are doing, um, you know, to use a baseball analogy, now that we are sufficiently into the baseball season, we're sort of rounding third base and heading for home as we think about the shutdown of the cash burning elements of our business, most notably Grand Prairie and consumer. And so I'm excited to, you know, close the chapter, open a new chapter that's clean, that's easy, I think, for people to understand. The growth is fueling um, is fueling excitement internally and um, the ability to parlay that into new opportunities as cash flows allow us to invest in new opportunities and uh, new products and, and new assets is is even more exciting. So more to follow, but we're we're sort of at the point where that chapter is coming to an end in the new A2 that is that is going to be characterized, we think, by not just top line growth, but by bottom line growth and profitability is um, is, is the chapter that we think we're about ready to open. Very good. I think we may have already covered this, but anything else that would be helpful for investors to understand about the business? I think the biggest biggest thing for us, Roger, is just to to make sure that investors know we're we're squarely focused on working for them. We want to make sure that we are driving shareholder value. That's our single biggest mandate, and um, we have made a lot of progress. I think over the last year to that end. And so, for investors that want to hear more, that want to dig deeper into any um, aspect of the of the A two story, happy to talk individually with them um, at at any time, either at the conference or beyond that. So, uh, happy to take additional questions and dig deep and really uh, invite folks to learn more about A two as we kind of move to this next chapter so thanks to anyone that has interest and would love to would love to entertain meetings with investors as uh, as we move forward here very good josh thank you so much uh for your time today we really really appreciate it thanks uh, Roger. and and just to add josh to what you said uh to any uh potential investors out there who've not already signed up for an a2 one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, please feel free to send me an email at weiss at lithumpartners.com or again, visit our website, which is www.lithumpartners.com slash virtual and click the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button. Uh, we hope you all enjoy the conference. Thank you.